Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us at Venture Cafe for another Artist Studio Tour. As Gary mentioned, my name is Angela McQuillan and I'm the curator at the Science Center in Philadelphia, which is also home to Venture Cafe. So tonight we're gonna to take a look inside the studio of Philadelphia-based artist Marjorie Ander. Marjorie creates beautiful mixed media installations that blur the boundaries between painting and sculpture. So I just want to emphasize that we'd love for this talk to be interactive and for you guys to actively participate in the discussion. So if you have a question or comment, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask Marjorie anything at any time. And you can also type it into the chat box. So Marjorie has had over 60 solo and two person exhibitions nationally and internationally, and is the recipient of more than a dozen awards and grants. She's also been reviewed by um, many prominent publications from all over the world. In, in 2012, she completed Walking on Sunshine, a permanent 4,000 square foot public art project in Septa Spring Garden Underground Subway Station in Philadelphia. Her work is featured in many permanent collections, including the Philadelphia Convention Center and the US Embassy in Latvia. So everyone now please welcome Marjorie Amder. Thank you, Angela. Uh, and I want to really thank you for including me in this series. Um, this series and others like um, this have made such a difference um, in my life over the course of the past uh, six months um, in this period of alone together. And so to be included is really an honor. And also, uh, it's great that Venture Cafe is, knows how important it is to host these types of events. So um, I must have prepared 50,000 ways to uh, different op options I could uh, make this presentation. And I wanted to take off my professorial hat, but I also am so um, steeped in giving certain kinds of presentations that I couldn't totally take it off. But basically, uh, uh, I wanted it to be a little different because this period that we're going through, or we continue to be going through is a period like no other. And it has, um, it has, there have been lots of ups and downs. And I guess I've had more time to just think and reflect, um, to try and do, not do too much ruminating, but to look, take stock of my career. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. And I kind of wanted to look at where I've been and where I might want to go. And always asking, how do you believe in something deeply? So um, two women who I want to uh, use as prompts for this uh, talk are Eva Hessa and Louise Bourgeois, both women um, are not alive, uh, but they probably were two of the most important uh, feminist artists of the 20th century and made a huge difference in my life, the world at large, and in the um, feminist movement. Their work was autobiographical in nature. Um, here is a piece of Louise Bourgeois, and this, um, this, these huge spiders, and these cells that she made. And I'm gonna show you a small clip uh, from uh, uh, where she peels a tangerine, and it's an about experience she had when she was younger. And then Eva Hesse also was uh, a woman, and in her, the period of time when she lived, she had tragically died when she was in her 30s. She was started to work with um, unusual art materials, materials that were not archival, and her work kind of lived in that place between art and craft and sculpture. And I, um, as an artist, have never been able, never fit neatly into a category. So both these women, I uh, have great respect for. Um, again, like I said, they were very strong women, yet they had a lot, both had a lot of inner demons. And unfortunately for their individual lives, it, they might have been difficult, but they also fueled uh, their work. So, um, I used to start when I was younger, my talks um, off this way because I could get over, get through nervous energy. But uh, Sala Witt uh, wrote a letter to Eva Hesse when she was in one of her periods 
um, of not knowing where she wanted to go. And she, he said, Dear Eva, it will be almost a month since you wrote to me. And if you have possibly forgotten your state of mind, I doubt it though, you seem the same as always. And being you, hate every minute of it. Don't. Learn how to say fuck you to the world once in a while. You have every right to. Just stop thinking, worrying, looking over your shoulder, wondering, doubting, fearing, hurting, uh, find, trying to find some easy way out. Stop struggling, grasping, confusing, itching, scratching, mounting, and blah, 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 blah. Just stop it and just do. And I think um, so many times we get caught up in what, um, thinking, trying to think of an idea as good or right or smart enough, I should just speak for myself, that it stops us from getting into the studio. And so for 30 years, I've had this letter, a uh, copy of this letter that Solowit wrote to Eva Hesse on my studio uh, walls. This clip, um, I'm going to show it, it's, um, and then we'll, it will lead into my talk. Oh, I have to share my screen. So, we can't actually see. Oh, there we go. We can see it now. Sorry. So this is a, this is something that my father did at the dinner table because there was a tradition of family uh, family dinners and everybody around the table was supposed to to bring some kind of entertainment. At the end of the meal, we were supposed to sing, or you were supposed to recite something, or you were supposed to be uh, <clears throat> entertaining. So this was his form of entertainment. You have to, you have to understand that in a tangerine, it is too important point. So, he would, nobody, understand, uh, nobody understood why, but he would draw a little figure, right? The head and the neck and the breast. And at the other end here, which was, which was an important point, you had the sex, right? You have to understand that, you had the sex. And then later on, you had the legs, right? The knees and, and, uh, and uh, the calves uh, and the feet, right? Now, now when, the, when this drawing was made, right, like this, pass me along. When this drawing was made, you were supposed to take a razor blade and cut it, right? Cut it like this, all around. So you ended up by lifting, right, by lifting the little figure. And you are going to see that this little figure is more interesting than she appears to be. So you lift up here the thighs, right? Lift up the thighs, thighs, right, like this. You have to cut it. You lift it, right, and then you, then, are you looking now? Yes. Yes, this is the important thing. You lift it, you extract it, right, at this point, right. And you see what is going to happen. You see that I know my job because you are going to see what, what is coming. You see what is coming? You see this? Right. 
So you see this? This is a little penis. Now, this whole story was addressed to me at the dinner table in front of everybody, right? And my father, who directed his stupid humor towards me, would say, Oh, this little figure is so pretty. I think she's my daughter, right? She's my daughter. Right. You see this little figure? How sweet she is? I thought she was my daughter. But obviously, she's not my daughter because my daughter has nothing there. So I would blush. I would, I would die on the spot in front of everybody. You know, I was not a man. I was, it's a feminist statement. I was not a man. I was only a woman who didn't have anything there. So it is a certain kind of humor. And it is a kind of humor which I, I find detestable, but that uh, my father appreciated. So everybody would burst out laughing. Right. That's all, that's uh, the whole story. Okay, so um, I shared that with you in that uh, we as artists are fortunate in that uh, we're able to uh, make art and uh, reconcile some of uh, things in our past and make it and then present it in the world and it becomes larger um, than uh, itself. So I'm in charge of starting a new uh, concentration at Rutgers Camden in art therapy. And I think that um, I've spent a lot of time over this period, over the pandemic, thinking about distinctions between art and um, art therapy. And uh, according to Alain Baton, John Armstrong in the book, Art as Therapy, they say art provides us with the means to remember, the means to feel sorrow, opportunities to rebalance ourselves and to grow and appreciate. I think from that period, and I'm going to over the next 30 minutes or so share with you um, my, an overview of my career and share some of uh, reminiscing about periods gone by. Um, so when art becomes bigger than therapy or bigger than a form of healing, it we share it out in a gallery in the public domain and it becomes um, something outside of ourselves so and it is then measured against others we as artists I think I feel so fortunate that I get to live my life as if I'm on an archaeological dig and choosing the uh, subject matter that I want to keep investigating and um, to get paid to do this so when I was um, younger I'm going to show you some initial works that really didn't, uh, were not successes, and then move on to points later in my career. So by understanding that within each of us reside multiple subpersonalities, we had the opportunity to work with these various facets and integrate them into the creative process. These initial pieces, this initial piece was, oh, sorry. Here. Sorry. Is it shared? Can you see the screen? Yeah, now we can. Okay, sorry. Um, this is the first time I've done this. Uh, so this was a piece, this is what two-sided uh, installation and uh, this was one side. Don't I get to hang on for a second? If you want to um, play the slideshow, you would go all the way to the top left and click play from the start. Shoot. All right, so I'm going to have to go. Sorry. No worries. Okay, try again. This is a piece that was a two sided piece. Um, it was um, installed and uh, it was about different types of. Uh, Sorry, I'm getting tongue-tied. It was an autobiographical piece. It's called 13 
Oh, man. Uh, sorry, you guys. I'm just really nervous. Um, I'm going to go forward. The reason I was showing you this work was that when artists make art, they don't succeed at all the uh, works they create. And it's important when one's making work that the work speaks not only to oneself, but to a larger audience. And so this piece, I uh, had uh, tight ropes walking across the work with these doll-like forms with their arms outstretched. And for me, they were symbols of um, uh, freedom. And um, basically, I also was, I was teaching children. And at the time, what we were told that when children have their arms outstretched, you know, all was good. And when they were holding themselves tightly, um, there were problems. But the problem with the problem when in, uh, exhibiting this work was people said, why do you have 200 crosses walking over you? And not that 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 might not be funny to others, but I'm Jewish and that I had no intention of having um, that happen. So I had the opportunity to show this piece again in California. And it was a piece um, about, I wanted to make a doorway. And the idea was, how do you let somebody in? Are you willing to take the steps into getting to know somebody? However, if you look at this piece now, it really is not an invitational piece. It's a piece about exclusion because uh, it's, wheel, it, it's not wheelchair accessible. So again, these were not all the various issues on the map at that point, but again, today we look at things differently. Then I actually lived in Philadelphia before getting into academia and I was working in creating installations. I was trained as a painter and a printmaker, yet the installation format is one that, um, where there is a good fit. So I would go into galleries, I would paint the ceilings, the walls, the floors, and turn um, the rooms into three-dimensional canvases. And in this particular piece, it was, I took uh, outline of my body with different plugs in it, different places for plugs, and I would write sayings in wire. And then in front of these figures were bathroom-like scales made out of wood. And the piece was a lot about getting triggered and women and weight. The interesting thing that happened during this piece, they were perfect, they were scales, and um, they weighed whatever you wanted them to weight, so how much better could that be? But what happened during this piece was that people asked me how much, they saw them as drawings. And I don't, for those of you who don't know, when you create installation, they're very time consuming, you don't make much money. And so what happened um, is I sold several of them and for the next 10 years of my life, when I created installation, I made the installation so that there were relics that people could take home. It didn't pay for the uh, cost of what an installation, you know, how much an installation costs, but it sure did help. Then I got a grant from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts and I did a performance piece at what was then the Painted Bride Art Center. It was called How Will the Invitation Read? And it was a piece that was about, we are invited into this life and how are we gonna write our invitations? I rented, um, I turned the bride into a cafe-like setting. I had put two people on uh, swings up above making commentary about people below, sorry. On the stage, there was a bed where people loved and hated and the hangers were symbolic of figures. There was a noodle pot where we wrote uh, Po poems and uh, human noodles. This was a hairdresser, the beauty parlor. And basically in the piece, there was this blue blob that greeted you at the door after you paid your uh, $5. And again, it was, a, and it was again, how, how, how long does it take for one to let themselves be close to another? Then I had the opportunity to do, sorry. Can you tell us what date that was installed at the Painted Bride? Oh, it was like a gazillion years ago. Do I have to? Um, oh, was, no. I mean, if you don't have the approach. No, no. It was pre, it was like 1990. Okay. You know? it, was, it was a long time ago. And then this was a piece that I did in Fairmont Park. For those of you who live in Philadelphia um, and know Marsha Mars, Moss, she was a curator of these projects annually for a very long time. 60 tons of gravel 
that I laid and then I painted and created this piece. Um, I painted it with insecticide sprayers. Um, I had rented a generator that to have out, um, you know, to have outside and maybe the night or two nights before I started the installation, I was at Home Depot and I saw these uh, insecticide sprayers and I asked somebody if I could run paint through them and they said no and I said I'll buy 20 and um, it, it was a piece that would only be up for two years so I could water down the paint and um, and it gave me the ability to work with 10 or 20 different uh, insecticide spray sprayers and make a much more delicate nuanced piece than I would have been able to. Okay. This is another piece that was of you know, the same nature, excuse the pun. Um, it was a smaller piece. However, I created forms out of uh, uh, welded forms covered with cement and then I carried patterns and things up over the pieces. So I share, I share this uh, with you in one respect, it might look like I was all over the place um, and when I'm making work, I was young. I finished graduate school by the time I was like 23 or 24 years old. And I really um, wanted to do a lot of experimentation. I think today, um, I want my students to not be totally focused. But when I was being trained, um, people had difficulty with the fact that I worked in so many different formats and um, uh, with materials. So I started teaching. And I, my first teaching job was in Fargo, um, I, in Moore, Moorhead, Minnesota. I lived in Fargo and my second job was in Bellingham, Washington. And uh, it was my first full-time teaching job. And my students were really making interesting work. And I would go home to my studio and make mud. And it was, it was very, very frustrating. So I've always been, um, I've always, whenever I get into creative difficulty or any kind of difficulty, um, emotional difficulty, I pick up self-help books. And for whatever reason, not that I remember much of what they say after uh, the fact, but they get me through these various periods. So this woman, um, Lucia Cappuccino, Joni, I think is how you say it, uh, she wrote a book that was called, um, that had to do with writing, with your opposite hand, your untrained hand. And in doing so, when you try to do that, if you're right-handed or if you're left-handed, you, it's a throwback to like ch when you're a child. And a lot of times when you're blocked creatively, doing something like this helps to unblock. So I said, what the hell, what do I have to lose? So I started asking, taking my right hand and asking my left hand question. It's like, okay, Margie, what's wrong? And my left hand would write like, fuck you. And I'm like, no, 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 really, what's, I want ice cream. So anyway, it would be all this back and forth, but ultimately in doing this, I became somewhat ambidextrous. And so what happened was I then started to create these pastel drawings on the and then I would put them on the wall and move from there. And my, the, my process of making art a lot of times is in starting new bodies of work, I put, sorry, huge pieces of paper on the wall and I just draw in a stream of conscious manner to uh, get through ideas, not to have to think in a linear way and to just really experiment till I can believe in something. So that whole notion of believing something deeply, for me, there's a, I have a process, a ways of getting there. Um, so I was teaching then in Bellingham, Washington, and I had never seen a hummingbird theater form. And I, a lot of times what I also do is when I see something, I make many of them. So I bought this hummingbird theater form and I started to make them out of paper mache and, um, hardware cloth. Also, I was using stand-ins for the body, and I started to use these boat forms. On the um, hummingbird feeder forms, they were covered with uh, tracing paper that I scribbled on, and then I cut into strips and covered the um, forms. So I went back to the hand scribbling on the tracing paper, cutting up the paper, and then making them uh, the coding of the form. They became three, like three-dimensional drawings. 
I knew the job was only for two years. I wanted to create installations, so I made everything was very lightweight, not archival, but it, I was able to ship boxes of materials to different sites to do installations. I continue to work this way today in terms of working, accumulating forms. I work with small forms and make many to create large environments. What you're seeing now is some of the framework or what went underneath the um, paper mache. And people started to say, Margie, why are you covering all these forms? They're beautiful like they are. And I was, that was, that was too easy. You know, like, this would be too easy. I need to, like, put far more time into developing the pieces. But I started to say, well, I started to ask myself, is that really, you know, valid? So do I need to do that? So these forms led into um, body of work that I continued for seven years to work with window screen wire. Also at the time, um, I uh, was reading a lot about feminism and women's work and I decided to make a piece using purses like as characters are like an alphabet and then their handles became calligraphy. And so this piece was called a paragraph of purses. And not that you could really read the piece, but basically it was a um, quote by a woman that said something to the effect of, do women work in mixed media or does mixed media choose women? That's obviously abbreviated, but it was kind of a spoof on text and women and materials. Okay, then I moved to New Mexico and uh, started a job where I was for 12 years. And um, my work, autobi much more overtly autobiographical in nature in my earlier career than it is now, but still, I would say my work is driven from a personal in internal landscape in that place. Um, I had just gotten divorced, and here we have um, a bride, so bridal dress hanging from the ceiling that's made up of words, all she ever wanted, all, all I ever wanted, all she ever wanted written in wire and the floor was covered with sand and was cut and around the forms were these um hanger bag forms with patterns of lace cut into them it was covered with paper mache the lace patterns were blown up and then i used them as stencils this is outdoor i'm going to go through these quickly outdoor project that based on the same uh ideas in Knoxville, Tennessee. I spent seven weeks there with two graduate students and we created these pieces. And I basically, again, the work was only, had to be up for two years. So I didn't have to work, uh, worry about all our, 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 things being archival. However, we, we welded the forms, covered them with cement. And then, believe it or not, we, the top was covered with paper and mache, but instead of using water, we used a um, plastic medium to cut. It was very, very labor intensive. And um, I say this labor intensiveness uh, is for me a sort of meditation. Um, I'm a person that can be all over the place. And I find that when I get in my studio, it's the one place where I stop. And there's uh, in the process of creating things over and over again and repetitively, um, things become much clearer. So after that, uh, I decided that I, want, I was going to work with window screen wire as if it was textile yard, yardage. I was influenced by the underpinnings of the, of the structure, uh, understructures of the other work. And so I started to buy um, patterns. This is all before the digital era. So I went to um, fabric stores and I bought patterns and I used, like I said, window screen wires if it was textile yardage. I followed the directions of patterns that I found and I began making forms. And these forms uh, for me were both, uh, they were kind of like haunted and I was living in New Mexico and the color was very, uh, the landscape was very subtle. So color came out um, uh, color got removed from the work and I this is that I think landscape impacts me greatly in ways that one wouldn't see initially 
But I do think that this is why color evaporated. The great thing about this was I got to walk into faculty meetings. I was looking at um, uh, women's magazines, looking for accoutrements and decorations and wedding magazines to see how I was going to decorate these chairs. So these were patterns from slip covers that I then embellished. And I sprayed, um, spray, put spray paint through lace to um, create the patterns on them. Marjorie, I just want to tell you, you're getting a lot of compliments on your early work. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's good to know, given that I feel like I'm incredibly tongue-tied. <laughs> oh, you're doing great. Um, anyhow, thank you. I appreciate that. So I was making these objects. I kind of called them ladies in waiting. Um, and these chandeliers were very opulent, but they were made out of window screen wire and uh, aquarium tubing with uh, wires inside to give them structure. So one of the things um, about my work is I don't know how to make things. And so it's the not knowing that uh, gets me to work in unusual ways and usual materials. And I think if I had spent more, being, spent more time being formally trained as a sculptor, if you will, I don't think that uh, I have such a sense of abandon when I made things. So the other thing that uh, is in the work and even until today is that I make something and I, when I take it down, I want to take all the parts apart so that I could then put it together in a different way. So this was a tapestry like piece, the flowers came off, I could show it then I could wrap it up and send it to another location, reattach um, the parts. So um, working with uh, like domestic objects, very tedious, very labor intensive work. And also at, uh, during this period in, until the present, even though I don't, I would not be called a, social practice artists. I've always worked with a community of people, primarily with students. And the, again, the, because the work is so labor intensive, one of the joyous parts of making the work is that I would have, we would have these conversations while making. That were conversations and dialogues about life and um, very sharing and nuances and stories were told. It was almost like a, a quilting bee. And I really value that point of um, the art making process. When I started doing that, people made comments like, you know, you're not really, other, you're having other people make your work, or you're not really an artist and all these kinds of things. Whereas today, now we have this whole, you know, it's very, um, you know, going into communities and making a difference, we, we highly, highly value. And I kind of have done that all along but again, within more of an academic arena. Then the, this next body uh, was inspired by uh, the short story, Yellow Wallpaper. I'm not sure if people are familiar with this. It's a, a short story about a woman, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And uh, it's a story about in Victorian times. She was an early feminist uh, writer. And she, the main character in this short story was a woman who was not well. She had a, uh, a doctor husband who basically took her to their summer cottage and uh, isolated her in a third floor bedroom. And the only thing is the only, um, she only had a window to look out of. Over a course of a period of time, she uh, became more ill. And she would look at this yellow wallpaper and she would start to see things in the wallpaper and she started to hallucinate. Well, I think um, the fascination with, with the yellow wallpaper is there's a very fine line between uh, uh, good mental health and not such good mental health. And artists, I think, we're very fortunate to be able to make art, but it's also how many times do you, if you're an artist, do you hear yourself say, um, it, the work's not talking to me or I say to my students, is the work talking yet? 
And so um, the whole notion of there are things in that wallpaper that nobody knows but me, I think really uh, stands true for all creatives, visual creatives. So this was the quote. There are things in the wallpaper that no one knows but me or ever will. The images grow stronger every day. Sorry, that should be in quotation marks. <laughs> These are details. So I made a room within a room. You walked into the gallery, then you took another step in. Um, there's a woman, her name is um, uh, Susan Stewart. She talks about something called a double interiority. And a double interiority, she refers to with referencing a locket. So that usually with inside of a locket, we carry something precious. So that's one step in, and then another step in, it's close to the heart. So I didn't make a locket, but the idea of building a room within a room was symbolic of this. Okay, then I collaborated with an artist who I met when I did the piece way many years before um, uh, with the, um, in Philadelphia, the 450 foot long piece. And this was a water room. We created a room, we had sandboxes, we flooded screens with water. And obviously ho homes are supposed to be uh, places of stability and this clearly was not. So that was an indoor space that you yes. had water in the, on the floor? We made, no, it was contained. We oh, made, right. you know, yeah, Got so it. It contained, it was at Vanderbilt University. Wow. This is another piece. This is at Carnegie Mellon and where I covered the walls with this is all window screen wire uh, with attached aquarium tubing. This, these are lace patterns that I uh, made out of wire. It's a two-sided piece. There's a, a, a swing, you know, a video of swings connecting the rooms. These lights were symbolic of the uh, skies in <clears throat> New Mexico. Then I had the opportunity to do a piece like this in an alternative space in New York. And I started putting embedding um, videos into static objects. And this is one I really started to kind of get noticed or written about. And it was again that I was an artist, I wasn't a painter, I wasn't a textile artist. The work over, you know, overlapped. And so I went out on a limb on this piece and took a um, uh, loan out like against my house and hired people to work with me and spent a lot of money thinking that things were this was going to be a piece or an installation that would really uh, change the direction of my life and so I did this piece and I got written about a little and I didn't sell anything and I had to go okay how am I going to make art now so it created a big change again no maybe I went back and I wrote from with my right, my left hand to my right hand. I don't remember. But in, the, in that period of time, I took a job here at Rutgers. So one of the things I do when I shift bodies of work, I kind of have the seven year itch or the 10 year itch when I seem to work with uh, a certain material becomes my material of choice. And then I run, uh, then I get to the end of it. And then now what? So for that, the window screen wire uh, period lasted for a very long time. So what I find many times is I initiate bodies of work by following instructions for do-it-yourself projects. And if patient enough, a tiny inner voice will eventually whisper, pay attention. It is then that I begin to have the necessary courage to start bending and stretching the rules that I had been following. This may take weeks, months, sometimes longer. What I did, excuse me, I just want to know, how am I doing time? How am I doing on time? Um, you have 20 minutes left. We, we oh. should have a little bit of Q and A. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So um, I have to, so then this body of work, sorry, this period of time, I started working with um, paint by number uh, templates. And again, uh, it was a period, I just started to do paint by numbers as a way to kind of buy time, waiting to find out what I was gonna do. And another uh, uh, seven years worth of work came from beginning with paint by number templates. 
So what I, the work usually starts with something more representational and becomes more abstracted. So I took paint by number templates and I enlarged them and then I painted and I laid wax and resin on them and I created depth through layering. And this is what led me to um, the, uh, the public art project. This is a piece that I showed in um, London. And basically, again, there are all these parts that take a very long time, very long period of time to make, but I can gather them up and then I can send them to another venue. And every time the piece gets installed, it has a different personality um, of the place and where it's installed. Can you tell us what those color discs are? They're just wood, they're wood dowels. They're wood oh. dowels covered with um, paint and uh, resin and or wax and resin. Then I put through my hat into the arena for this public art project. Um, uh, except there was a call for artists and this is a project that I spent two years working. It was an amazing project. I was able to work in my studio to create these huge drawings that were then create, translated were scanned, then translated into material embedded in resin. Unfortunately, I really didn't want to do these just on the computer. I wanted them, to, the actual pieces in the end, to have a sense that you would be walk, walking on a collage. So this is what the pieces looked like originally. If anybody saw them at the beginning, they're, they're in very bad shape now. It breaks my heart. Um, Okay, so quickly, because this is the work that I'm doing now, after completing Walking on Sunshine, two-year journey, public art project, I had a hunch that I wanted to start to make something soft. I did not want to make a pillow. That was all that I knew. After many failed experiences, I began working on yoga mats with pastels that required using an applicator with a sponge on the tip. I didn't like the drawings. I didn't like the drawings. However, there was something about the sponge. I decided to ask the Google gods for assistance. I Googled sponge, and that's where this chapter of my story began. How could a miniature commercially fabricated and disposable object such as the cosmetics, cosmetic sponge become the vehicle that I needed to find to take the next creative leap? So this is how they began. Again, once again, no, I wasn't using wooden dowels, but I ordered all these uh, uh, cosmetic sponges and I started covering them with pastel pigment and I, uh, this was a show that was in um, Anchorage. Making, this was a period of time I worked with students. We made, we told stories, we listened to books on uh, iPads. And uh, so that was the first way that I started them. There was, it, it didn't, I did, it didn't resonate. And I wanted to make, I wanted to use them more um, as if they were on a painting. So I started gluing them to canvas and hanging them up vertically. At the same time, I was looking at um, living gardens, living walls. Um, this is a quote, our most fun fundamental relation to the gigantic is articulated in our immediate and lived relation to nature as it surrounds us. Our position here is the antithesis of our position to the miniature. We are enveloped by the gigantic, surrounded by it, and closed within its shadow. So my work, I would say, is very much about detail and yet becomes gigantic. So these are what it, the pieces can look like before they're colored. I'm just gonna go through these. I was very fortunate at the US Embassy purchased pieces and sent me to Latvia and to Suriname. Uh, this is installed in the ambassador's home. This piece is in uh, the embassy in Suriname. This is a how the pieces look being made. I then started um, taking the pieces and having them scanned and drawing that on them and tracing them in Photoshop to come up with these lines. And these led to a piece that I did in a temporary Installation. Um, there's Emma. Uh, saved me through the quarantine. This was at the airport. 
these are the convention center. This was a piece that led to work that where I am now. So I'm just going to go through these because there's a few more images which I won't talk about. But this particular image and this image were the point what I really wanted to have happen in the work, which I'm also thinking about now, is creating work that uh, can be part become become part of a wall but can be taken off and worn as a garment. So I'm struggling with um, a way to do that. I think during this pandemic, the issue, the yellow wallpaper came back. Um, uh, you know, it's always been an undercurrent, but I'm thinking about it again. And it's more now the idea of pulling the paper off the wall and becoming, coming with us into um, daily life. So it's kind of about lineage and heritage and bringing our past with us, our legacies, our gifts, its burdens. And I probably don't have time to talk about uh, this, the work that I started to do with Braille, but I'm just gonna just quickly go through these. This is a piece I did in Havana. It was edible fabric. <laughs> this was in Istanbul biennial last year. So my timing, I should, probably shouldn't have showed. <laughs> Great, we're enjoying it. All right. Um, what, how do you get color on the sponges? Believe it or not, I sponge them with sponges. <laughs> I um, basically use the pastels that are, have you seen them? They're in like these pots of color. Um, they're called pan pastels. So, um, and then we'll take a sponge and I'll use it as if it was, you know, you're putting makeup on and then I'll co cover the sponges with the sponge. So the tool becomes the, um, the vehicle as well. This is, um, these are made out of um, parachute material. What I started to do now is I'm taking and dismantling the um, cosmetic sponge piece so that what you're, I won't go into this story. Then I had the opportunity just recently to do a piece in um, a beauty salon. So alone together, I guess we'll just forget all this. But here's my studio <laughs> real quickly. So I have a question for you. Yeah. And I think there's an echo in the background. Um, so you mentioned from the beginning, you've always sort of been into this like feminist cause in your work. And I feel like even using the cosmetic sponges sort of addresses um, women's materials. But how do you feel, you've been practicing art for a very long time. How do you feel that, you know, the situation was for a female artist when you first started and how have things changed now? Well, um, I think, I mean, think it's, really quite interesting. I, as I said earlier in my work that I think my work was overtly about um, being, uh, it was about domesticity and femininity and uh, feminist issues earlier in my career. I think the work has absorbed, you know, those issues and it's not so overt. So yes, I, by using a cosmetic sponge, it kind of turns uh, these issues up, so, upside down and subverts them. But um, the work for me is not as much about domesticity and those kinds of issues of uh, labor and gathering and collecting. And a lot of people talk about my work like that, but I think at this point in time, um, I wouldn't say it is so overtly driven from that place. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers. I don't know, so you're younger and as a woman artist, you know, it was very important when I was older, when I was younger, to be known as a woman artist. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I guess I've been reading, like I just read through The Flower by Judy Chicago. Oh, yeah. And she was, you know, that's written in 1973. And she's talking about how like women weren't even really taken seriously in the art world back then at all. So how, like, how do you feel like over your career opportunities have become more available for women? I still think that there's clearly, it's, it's clearly, um, more difficult for women than it 
has been for men, I think it's really changing. Um, I think with everything that's going on uh, in our culture right now, um, uh, it's going to change even more, both uh, racially and for women. So um, please, God, come um, November, we'll be going down um, a different trajectory so that that it, it can only grow out of that. I, I think it will, there will always be a tension. I think there is, they're just inherent in, uh, at least at, at, during my lifetime. You know, I, I don't know what will happen in the future. I think there will always be some sense of friction, but I do see, I don't feel like I have to fight in the same way. Yeah, that's great. Uh, do you see a difference even in your life? Um, you know, I haven't ever really experienced uh, like a lot of sexism in my own practice. Um, but I definitely, I, I feel like things have changed recently uh, for the better and hopefully- It takes a long time. Yeah. I mean, I used to not be able to use the color pink when I was in undergraduate school because it wasn't, you know, it was too feminine or too docile. So things yeah. change. Um, so we'd love to see your studio. I just wanted to open it up. Does anyone have any questions for Marjorie or comments or anything they'd like to say? Uh, yes. <laughs> Go ahead. So I'm, I'm Martin Rosenberg. I was chair of the department at Rutgers Camden that hired Marjorie. And I've always been tremendously impressed by her creativity, her courage in jumping out beyond where she understands herself to be at a given time. And I think she's just a highly original artist and a very articulate one as well and a wonderful teacher. And uh, I value her very, very highly as a colleague and a friend. Thank you, Marty. Thank you for coming and listening. Marjorie? Yes. I've known you since I think one of our first drawing classes when we were maybe what, 14? <laughs> and I've been following you as one of my dearest, dearest artist friends. And I, I was so struck today by seeing the, the large wire rooms of the furniture and the uh, slip covers and the large purses and the tassels and the, it was austere and it was kind of mysterious. And, but it was, there was such an underlying, for me, a feeling of deep femininity. And I feel like it's just so carried when I saw that absolutely lush, passionate, what was the piece that went to the embassy, the red sponges that was full of, I just think full of womanhood, <laughs> full of women, full of love and passion. And I feel the connection, you know, through that part of your work. I even see that in the piece that you have up here, I almost feel some of the wire. And I think the work is definitely well. circling, circling back. Yeah, I mean, it's I, just extraordinary. Your work, it, I don't feel, when you say you're all over the place, <laughs> I love the journey. I love that you journeyed and expressed it all. And it's so apparent in seeing your work, you know, in this kind oh. of a format and presentation. And thank you so much. I, it was oh, it's thank really you. extraordinary. Thank you, really. So this presentation has been amazing. Um, if you want to go, we have like four minutes left, but if you want to give us a quick little peek around your studio, that would be awesome. Um, my computer died, but I can try to figure it out. My new assistant's computer died, so I think, but, um, let me see. Okay. If it doesn't work out, we can do a couple more questions too. Okay. One of the things, um, I will say is that even though my work ends up not being narrative through illustration or text, I think the processes in my work um, have a narration. So this issue of lineage uh, and legacy um, and the, also the fact that I'm getting older uh, is inherent in the work. So by taking like the 
work that, um, wait, what are you seeing now? Are you seeing my studio? Right now I can see you and your okay. beautiful art piece behind you. Okay, so the work that you're seeing here has been stripped back, right? What I'm now doing on some of the pieces, again, so many things have happened by accident. I, some gel medium fell on one of these pieces. And the next day I went and there was canvas on it and I pulled the canvas off and it transferred. Hmm. You can see, can you see this? Um, I think I have to, sorry, I have to make, um, Jen, a co-host. Or but, yeah, just bring it close. We can see it if you come close to your computer. Yeah, cool. Okay, so I'm sharing this with you now that I do not know <laughs> where this is going. However, I have like about a hundred <laughs> of these pieces that basically what I now do is I coat uh, the panels with gel medium intentionally and lay fabric down, let them dry and pull them off. And so it's a transferring technique. And for me, in my work, that transferring is about generation. So, I don't have the story to tell uh, in the same way other artists do um, who are more pictorial, um, uh, illustrative than I am, but it does, but the, my, the processes somehow that I land on speaks to what I'm going through, I think, and fortunately what we're all going through in this, you know, in this period of time, right? And I feel very fortunate that somehow I've been able to uh, work and make work that still uh, speaks to the time. And I also am very clear that I want to repurpose and recycle. Um, you know, I want to recycle work now. I never in my entire life had done that. And I think it's really important to do that now. Yeah, so. definitely. Oh. Well, thank you so much for showing us this inside look into your studio and your process. This has been an amazing talk. There's been, you know, you have so many diverse like periods in your practice that are that are really inspiring. And um, I really appre appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you for the invitation. And yeah. Hope to see you more. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Here comes a good dog. Very good. Thank you. Dog. I'm thinking that if they stop.